So first, I want to thank you all for bearing with us as we rescheduled it as Answer Lab was reacting to our new reality. And I also wanted to share that you're probably looking at the screen and thinking, wow, those people are sitting really close together. That's not our reality anymore. And we've taken that into account as we re-looked at this webinar and thought through the content. How do we make sure that these strategies are things you can continue to implement in our new reality? Uh, as Henry mentioned, this uh, meeting will be about 45 minutes. That's also because we condensed it from 60, which was our original plan. Um, we are doing that to make sure you can get back to whatever uh, commitments you have in your home environment, either roommates or family members or, uh, or even your pets who may be calling for you at the same time. Uh, but because we're doing 45 minutes, we don't have a lot of time for questions actually, but our lack of time for questions does not reflect a lack of interest in your questions. So please do feel free to enter any question you have into our Zoom platform. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, I'll also provide an email address where you can send your questions as well. We really want to be a resource for all of you right now as you're continuing to find ways to be influential uh, in this current time. Now, our new reality is very much like this. All of us working remotely, connecting to one another remotely, and finding unique ways to have influence now is more important than ever. So to help you continue with your research at this time, uh, Answer Lab has actually put together a guide to remote research. If you haven't seen this already, I'll encourage you to check it out. We wanted to make sure that we could be as supportive to everyone in the community as possible right now. And before we jump into the content, I wanted to share just a few words about why this topic is so important to me. I started my career at a small startup that was owned by SoftBank. And I had a really cool job where I could sit with all the executives and watch as they made business decisions about what would go on the website. And what I noticed was that each one of the leaders of the business functions would argue within their own best interests of their team about what should be in the user's experience. But no one was arguing from the perspective of what do the users want? And what I learned at that point in time was what Alan Cooper has said one time on Twitter, which is that creating a good user experience is not a design problem, it's a power struggle. So in that moment, I felt a calling that I had kind of an inner Norma Ray, as you'll see here in this picture, where I wanted to stand up for and give the voice to the users so that they would have more power in those business decisions. So over the last 20 years, I've had lots of conversations with UX leaders, and I often ask this question, how would you rate your UX team's influence in the organization? And what I typically hear is an answer between six and seven on a scale of one to 10. With the exception of one company, uh, actually Slack, which told me a nine. So one of the questions is why doesn't every company and every UX team have a level nine or 10 level of influence within their organizations? And first I'd like to say there are lots of obstacles to influence, uh, they're structural, there are maturity issues, cultural issues, there are institutional issues, there are visibility issues that can all uh, be fairly large and feel insurmountable for any one person to overcome. But I'm pretty confident that these strategies I outlined today will help you overcome these. And let me talk just quickly about what I mean by each one of these. So by a structural obstacle to influence, I mean, where does user experience sit within the organization? Uh, what is the culture of the organization? Is it product-led, engineering-led, design-led? Um, all of these variables, where you sit, uh, is your UX practice centralized, decentralized, or hybrid? All these things will influence your ability to have influence. Next, maturity. Is your organization customer-obsessed? Does the CEO go out for customer visits? If you have a great deal of maturity in your organization, your influence might be stronger. If you have a low level of UX maturity in your organization, it might be lower. And then lastly, visibility. Is there someone who sits at the top of your team who socializes everything that you do within the organization and gives a voice to your work? Whether or not you have this could also have a huge impact on your influence. But you don't have to be the person sitting at the top of the org chart in order to have influence on others. There are lots of techniques that you can follow day in and day out 
and small actions that you can take that will actually allow you to have more impact. So before we jump in to the five strategies, I'd like to ask everyone to just take about 30 seconds to think about this one question. What influencing challenges are you facing? And if you could take 30 seconds and just write it down on a piece of paper, we're gonna come back to it later. So I'll pause right now while you have time to think. Okay, let's jump in. Well, you're gonna talk about five strategies today. And here's what we're not gonna talk about. We're not going to talk about what's table stakes in UX influence. And what do I mean by table stakes? Things that are table stakes in UX influence are having and growing empathy and being an exceptional storyteller. These are not part of the five strategies because I think these are the two things that everyone in UX needs to have as a skill and that has been discussed quite a bit in our industry. So if you feel like you're struggling in these two areas, I think this is the first place to start before you even start on these five strategies that I'm gonna be taking us through today. So with that out of the way, let's talk about our very first one, become a trusted advisor. So why would you wanna become a trusted advisor? It's because there is a great irony that is true in the UX world. It is this, that UX teams who do not want to be considered services functions focus on delivering exceptional service. I'm gonna repeat this. UX teams who do not want to be thought of as a services function actually focus on delivering exceptional service. That's because they become partners instead of vendors within their organizations when they focus on this approach. They become indispensable to the success of their stakeholders and not a nice to have. And all great service partners start by making themselves personally a trusted advisor to others in the organization. So what does a trusted advisor look like? Let's talk about the anatomy of one. First and foremost, they consider themselves in service to stakeholders. They think I'm not just helping our customers in my job, I'm helping my colleagues produce better work and I'm helping them grow in their careers. Next, they do discovery on their stakeholders. They try to make sure they understand their needs to ensure alignment between their work and the work of their stakeholders. And I really love this story that a very senior level uh, UX leader at Salesforce told me. Before she came into the organization, she learned that uh, her predecessors had not had a great relationship with the, the stakeholders of her team. And so she spent a year trying to rebuild relationships so that she could add value to the organization. And she had a mantra, which is this, what you need to be doing is finding out what keeps them up at night. And then you say, I can solve for that. Finding out what keeps them up at night and saying, I can solve for that. I love this quote because it's what we hear many of our clients say that they're trying to do for their stakeholders and for the leaders in their organizations. And it's how Answer Lab thinks about servicing our clients as well. Now, there's a fourth part of a trusted advisor, and that's around how you align your activities with the stakeholders KPIs. Uh, one of our clients at Google shared a story about how she actually uh, looks at aligning all of her team's own KPIs with how her stakeholders KPIs are aligned. She looks at how are they measured on engagement, revenue, or loyalty, and makes sure that those things are really closely tied together because by doing so, the stakeholder then sees her team as already being on their side. Trusted advisors also create strategic wins for shared success. So one of our clients at Amex convinced a general manager of his group that 
before she rolled out a global mobile redesign that she should do pretty extensive international testing on it to make sure it wouldn't fail. The result was that it was a resounding success because they did iterative research on it. He ended up with a very strong partnership and alliance with that GM because of their shared win. And then she reorged where he sat to report directly to her. So he, his influence continued to grow over and over again because they had a shared win together. Trusted advisors also nourish their relationships with their stakeholders. So they create ways to bond together outside of just doing the day-to-day -day work. So bonding may be more difficult during these times. Um, we're not in person with one another and we're not going to happy hours or going to bowling alleys like we once were. But our teams have looked at other ways to bond with others, like putting together game nights with people you might not normally interact with, or putting together pet meet and greets through Zoom, or having work from home buddies and finding other ways to connect outside of the regular workday. So the bonding is really key to continuing to create trust beyond just the work environment. I want to take a minute to talk about the difference between a gatekeeper and a trusted advisor. Because when I work with companies, I often see that some teams can fall into this camp of being a gatekeeper. Gatekeepers are not successful in being influential because they come to the point of the conversation from a place of control, from saying, this is my process, you have to follow it, to saying, no, this is my methodological approach and this doesn't fit into it. Um, gatekeepers come from a place of authority and hierarchy. They often answer questions with no and why. Trusted advisors come from a different place. They seek to influence um, through being collaborative, through being solution-oriented, through being flexible in their approach. They primarily come to the solution from a place of yes and, which you often hear in uh, improv classes. And I wanna take a moment to talk about that difference between gatekeeper and trusted advisor, particularly right now in the context of COVID-19. I'm looking across the internet and seeing so many conversations about uh, remote research at the moment on Medium and Google UX groups. There's so many questions around, oh gosh, we're losing so much information because we're now doing remote research instead of in person. Or the results of all of this work we're doing are gonna be skewed because of the pan pandemic. Or remote research should only be done as a complement to in person. And I wanna note that at a moment like this, where COVID-19 is gonna be our new reality for at least another year, and where our stakeholders are dealing with budget cuts and layoffs and more pressure than other to have their products hit their key KPIs, it's not the time to look at putting up barriers and saying no. Now is the time to not say, what do we lose by shifting to remote research? But instead, what can we gain? How can we add value to a stakeholder? And by reframing our thoughts this way, it'll help make sure that we avoid being a gatekeeper. So I really love this quote from a director at Slack who I spoke with, and she said, there's a lot to be said about building trust from the beginning. Sometimes the way you do that is simply by saying yes. So I hope that all of you will think of other ways that you can be collaborative with your stakeholders by helping them in their roles. Okay, strategy number two, create emotional journeys. In my conversations with UX leaders, I discovered really many were not aware that their most successful moments of influence actually came from the shrewd use of emotional persuasion. And that often the persuasion involved kind of multiple touch points over time, that when they reviewed it later, they, all, they could finally see there was a journey they were taking people on. So let me tell you a story uh, about why this is so important. Most importantly, when you take someone on a journey, you're choosing to meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. Meaning uh, you, you understand where their mindset is today and you tailor your discussion points to be where they are today rather than the future state of where you think they need to be. So let me give you an example uh, from one of our clients at Google. She came into her role and she discovered after reviewing a lot of discovery and basic research that there were really foundational issues with the product that they had. And she said, I need to start having some conversations with engineers. So she shared some video clips to just really display all the problems they were having. 
And the result was the engineering was very surprised and they jumped into action, but they actually tended to focus on more bug fixes rather than the bigger picture. And they questioned, is there really a product issue here given that we've only seen a handful of videos? So she said, okay, that's where they are today. Let me bring different set of data to them to help with this conversation. So she went and gathered as much quantitative data as she possibly could to illustrate the larger product issues. And the result at this point was that the engineering team became very fearful. They were worried. There was finger pointing, but they were bought into addressing the issues. And at this point, they felt they lacked a compelling vision. They were like, well, where are we going? Okay, we're gonna fix this. Where should we head? So at that point, she brought to the table storyboards with a vision for the product that could better support user needs. And the engineering team moved from a place of fear to a place of inspiration and excitement over what they could do in the future and what they could accomplish. And in fact, they were so excited that they reorged their team into journeys, uh, teams based on the journeys that they wanted their users to be supported by. So I wanna ask you to take a minute to think about this. If this particular leader had decided to come to the organization first with these storyboards saying, this is the end result of where I think we need to be because these are all the problems in the product. No one would have agreed with anything. Uh, she needed to take this team on an emotional journey, meeting them where they were at each step in order to get the outcome that she wanted. And because she invested in understanding where they were at each step, she was able to get something that most people could really never imagine, which is a reorg into journeys. Strategy number three, compare to convince. So you might not be able to believe it, but once there was a time, a little over 10 years ago, when FedEx actually had no UX practice. So a company that really prides itself on service to the, com the, the customer really had no function in the business that was focused on the user experience of its digital experiences. But one gentleman changed all that and his name was Bryce Stokes. And Bryce did this with one primary strategy. He compared FedEx to other trusted brands and showed executives how far behind they were. And he did this with three key steps. First, he reached out to his agency partners and he said, what do you know about uh, what's going on in this space? Can you introduce me to other companies that are really excelling at UX right now? He was a sponge for white papers and research reports, and he really was not shy about asking for help and introductions. So he went to, to seek outside help. The second thing he did is he looked at external research. So he did his own listening tour. He went around to other companies. He interviewed UX leaders. He understood how they built their practices. He, he asked them, how did they decide how to determine the size of their teams? He asked them how they built culture, a culture of UX into their companies. He just wanted to be a sponge for what everyone else did. And then lastly, he took everything. He learned from his agency partners and from his external research, and he did an internal roadshow. He brought everything back to the executives and he shared how far behind FedEx was compared to others in the space and then built a, basically a business case for internal investment in the UX teams. He worked tirelessly going throughout the organization to help people get over the fear of other teams losing the concept of design to a new UX practice. But he didn't stop here. Um, he also took one idea that he heard from Wells Fargo was doing back at the time uh, where they held a World Usability Day event to kind of showcase what the UX teams were doing. And he launched his own World Usability Day event with 200 people in Memphis. And over time, that's now translated into a 500 person uh, event through multiple teams. That's their digital co transformation conference. It's become huge. So Bryce did a lot to get FedEx where it needed to be in the beginning stages. And so I asked him recently, what do you think it was that finally got the executives to invest in UX? And he said, peer pressure. I think it was the peer pressure that other companies are doing it and they wanted to be playing in that space. So peer pressure is an interesting thing. We're taught to ignore it in school. 
But I'd like to offer that we can actually use it as a valuable tool if we're using it strategically to make lives better for users. So if you think about how you might be able to use this, um, Imagine there's a brand that all of your executives respect or some of your stakeholders respect. There's quite a bit you can do to research how they got to where they are, to benchmarking yourself against them. You can do quantitative research to benchmark against them, and then you can share the gaps to help convince others that much needed change needs to happen in your organization. And the reason that this strategy works time and time again is that no one wants to be a laggard in the industry or in their organizations. Okay, strategy number four, carefully design your conversations. I'd like to start with a rule of thumb that I personally follow, and that is to spend more time preparing for a crucial conversation than you'll actually spend on the conversation itself. So for example, if you're planning an hour long conversation about like a super thorny subject with your stakeholders, you should spend about two hours preparing for that conversation and visualizing how it's going to go in your mind. In fact, uh, most of us on this call have some experience, I'm sure, with design thinking, and you can use your very clever design thinking skills to ensure you have a great conversation and to design the conversation. So I mentioned earlier this concept of meeting people where they are. It's critical to ask yourself before you start a conversation with someone where you're trying to convince them of something is are they ready to hear what you have to say or does this need to be a process of multiple conversations over a period of time. You can also think about meeting them where they are either physically or digitally. Physically when we get back to our new normal and digitally today. So by physically, I mean, here's an example of a, 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 this leader that I spoke with um, and have worked with at Salesforce who really wanted to convince a stakeholder to re-engage with the kind of work her team was doing. The stakeholder had not been listening to various attempts and overtures, so she perfected an elevator pitch and found him walking out of the building one day uh, and stalked him and, and ran up and gave her pitch to him. And it was successful because she met him where he was physically and she had a really good pitch. You can think about this for yourself as well. Where might your stakeholders be hanging out where you want to uh, really convince them to do something? Is there uh, a Slack channel they might be on? Uh, is there, can you give them a phone call? Uh, is there an email that you can send? But really craft that pitch to be perfect so that you're meeting them where they are conceptually, not only where they are physically hanging out. The second point in using design thinking to plan your conversations is to always set expectations. Think about what you want to get out of the discussion before you head in. And this isn't just about setting the agenda, but also about really committing to the key decisions that have to be made by the end of the, the meeting. A director from uh, Schwab, a director of UX, shared with me that he kicks off every UX project with some kind of discussion around how are the teams going to work together? And then he highlights the potential landmines so that his teams and the stakeholders can avoid them on the project together. So being able to look proactively and see what could be a problem ahead uh, helps set everyone's expectations. Next, carefully craft your supporting data for your conversation. So it's really important to think about what data is going to most influence your stakeholder. So if you want to make a strategic suggestion, you would want to use foundational research, not usability data. If you have a skeptic, you'd want to think about having more quant data. So make sure you pull the right information to support your argument. And then lastly, design the environment. So the space and the time and the day that you have the conversation is critical. Um, if you want to uh, address a very strategic issue on a potentially thorny topic. Um, talking to people when they're most tired or when they have the most to do items on their list is, is not great. So think carefully about where your stakeholder is going to be mentally in your meeting and arrange around that. 
Um, in the physical world, I'd often say, think about a, the right, picking the right conference room that's more expansive, that perhaps has a view if you're trying to think about something strategic and forward looking. Uh, in the, in, back in the old days, I'd say, think about how you could do a walk and talk. But there are ways of doing that even now. Um, although we can't decide where we're going to physically have the conversation, you can think about the Zoom environment that you're creating. What are you putting as your background photo? Is that something that's going to help tell the story or bring a tone to the meeting that you're having? Um, you can still do walk and talks. Think about being on the phone. If you're in a space that where you can socially distance um, or you're in an environment where it's safe to do so, you could still walk and talk outside even though you're not physically together. So think creatively about designing the environment to be most conducive to the conversation that you want to have designing that conversation is as important as having the conversation. Okay, strategy number five, give your ideas life. So uh, UX leaders who have the most influence, they find ways to make their insights and ideas live beyond the presentation itself and to thrive in the organization when that leader isn't around. So most of your inboxes probably look like this or worse. That's true of your stakeholders as well. Everyone receives hundreds of emails a day. And on top of that, we have Slack or other uh, ways of connecting socially in our, in our offices and other instant messages. It's, we're bombarded all the time. Um, a while back, the World Bank did a study. They wanted to know, uh, are people actually reading our PDFs and started looking into their own data? And what they find, found was that many of their PDF reports had never even been downloaded, not even once. So that brings me to a very important truth, which is PowerPoint and PDF are where ideas go to die, not where ideas go to thrive. So we have to be thinking more like content marketers if we want to get our ideas heard and out in our organizations. What does a content marketer do? Well, first, they broadly socialize the strategic work of their teams with push and pull strategies. Uh, UX researchers at Google, they often send these summaries of what they've learned from their customers and in newsletters out to the broader organization. Some of them have their own websites as well, where you can see schedules for when research and different activities are going to happen. So using both push and pull strategies to communicate. Content marketers also integrate their content into where stakeholders are doing their work. So how can you take your insights um, and integrate them into the workflow where the decisions are being made by designers? So one of our clients, Amex, puts insights into their collaboration platform, which is Confluence. Uh, there are other tools where you can send videos in through Slack to where people are having work conversations to help them make decisions. The important thing here is to make sure the content makes it to the place where the decision is being made. Uh, content marketers also tailor their content to their audience segment so that nobody gets irrelevant inf information. So thinking about if I'm sending this email out, is this content a broad piece of content with a broad number of people receiving it where they're going any particular group is going to have to dig to get the insights that are important to them? Or have I really tailored it to just the right people with just the right information that they need to hear? Content marketers also write very tantalizing subject lines that make people want to open it. So instead of sending out an email that says prototype version three, their email will say the call to action. Please review prototype version three by end of day at 3 p.m. Um, they also write sound bites in their emails using bolding and bullets rather than paragraphs of text that are hard for people to get through. So I really loved this quote from uh, one of my friends who works at Schwab is the director of research of, of UX there, excuse me. He says, I tell my team constantly to focus on the outcomes and not the outputs. So that seems sort of counterintuitive, right? Because what we really want is to make sure we're using the right tools. Um, but if we think about what outcome we want the particular communication mode to have, we're more likely to pick and design a communication mode that isn't PowerPoint and PDF, but is an approach that will have the outcome that we want and have the level of influence uh, and impact that we want. 
Okay, so I spoke extraordinarily fast. As a Southerner, that might be the fastest I've ever spoken to try to get all this in today. And there are five strategies here that we went over. Become a trusted advisor, create emotional journeys, compare to convince, carefully design conversations, and give your ideas life. What I would love for everyone to do right now is to think back and look at that question that you first answered about what some of your uh, influencing challenges were. And I'd love you to just take a minute and think through the five strategies that I went through today and decide which of those could you maybe use to solve this problem and the, the challenge that you identified earlier. So think about which of these strategies could help you. So I'm gonna leave this here and let you guys take a minute or so to do that. And then we'll follow up with a poll and a few more things. Okay, great. Um, now you've had a little bit of time to think about this. I'm gonna ask Henry to pop open a poll to ask all of you, which strategy from today could you use to solve the UX challenge you identified earlier? And then we'll take a look at the results. I'm always curious which one of these tends to be the most useful for folks. Okay, Henry, feel free to show the results when they're ready. Oh, interesting. Okay, there's kind of all over the place, but it looks like carefully designing conversations coming in the top. That's great. Very interesting. I'm glad to see that all of them are adding some level of value for you guys. And since we do have a few more minutes, I'm going to take the liberty of answering a question or two. So, uh, I see one question that's popped in. If anyone wants to enter in any others, feel free to do so. Uh, but I'll answer this first one and repeat it to everyone. Several people in my company are already interested in comparing our experience to others. It's unclear though, who's in our competitive set or which companies we should assess. Any resources in this space? Uh, well, not knowing what space you're in, uh, it's hard for me to give an immediate answer, which I'd encourage you to also email me later, I'm happy to. But one way to do this may be to think about, um, it sounds like you might be in a unique area that's new, but maybe think about the specific tasks that people complete uh, related to your experience, and then look for similar tasks that may be in other industries. So if it's not clear who your competitors are, if you have an onboarding experience, 
well, there are many other brands that have onboarding experiences. You could you look to compare yourself to other onboarding experiences, um, or if you have a you know an online customer support uh, experience, uh, maybe there's another brand with a that you know probably many many brands we could choose from that you could benchmark yourselves against, even if they're not in the exact same industry as you. So uh, that's one way to approach it. But feel free also to uh, email us later. And with that, I will share an email address that you can send a question to. It's info at answerlab.com. We are happy to support you guys in any way uh, you need it, not only around influence, but also anything related to how do we navigate remote research right now. Uh, we've got 130 people in Answer Lab who've been working on this problem for 15 years, and we would be delighted to share all of our best practices with you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I'll turn it over to Henry to close things up. Thanks, Amy. I'd just like to thank you for that brilliant presentation. I hope everybody found it really informative. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. So as you can see here, though, I'd like, you, uh, like to suggest you connect with us. You can do so on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. And you can also visit our blog um, at the address listed there. If you don't already know about it, we produce loads of great content really regularly. Um, on all things UX research. So I really would encourage you to check it out. Okay, um, and with that, we'll give you some time back today. I'd like to thank everyone again for joining um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you everyone, stay safe and healthy.